Welcome to the Making Space podcast. And guess what? This is season two. And we have so many great conversations planned for you during this season. The goal of this podcast is to talk about physical spaces, buildings, built environments, facilities, through a lens that I think is innovative and interesting because we're looking at what those environments, the effect that those environments have on our formation. And so I'm joined by my all round good guy, co-host, Jay Kim, pastor, author. Jay, this season, man, I can't wait to get started. Yeah, it's good to be back, Benjamin. It's uh, been too long. Season two, here we are again. Um, Yeah, in this season, uh, we're going to explore, obviously, space and how space informs, but more importantly, forms us and shapes us. And specifically, we're going to explore ideas of community and belonging and how the spaces in which we find ourselves um, shape our sort of sense of communal belonging uh, to God and to to one another. Uh, we also want to let everybody know, um, we told you guys in season one, and uh, it continues to be true. This podcast is one small part of a much larger project. So uh, many of you have given wonderful feedback about the first journal, and um, we've got a second journal uh, that's available now. You can go to aspengroup.com slash making space podcast, or if you're a Barna Access Plus uh, member, you've got access to it already as well. And today, Benjamin, today is a special day because I'm outnumbered. We've got um, not one, you, but two, two Australians with the impeccable accents joining us today. And uh, seriously, I can't wait. Um, Our guest is someone I've long admired for a long time. Yeah, we're multiplying, Jay. You can't keep us Australians down. <laughs> That's right. And in fact, That's right. season one, you know, you and I were often on a different continent. Now we're in the same state for season two, yes. both in California. But super excited to have our guest today. Mark Sayers is the senior leader of Red Church in Melbourne, Australia. He's passionate about spiritual and neural and the future of the church. His books, by the way, are fantastic. I'm an avid reader of them, including A Non-Anxious Presence, and reappearing church. Lives in Melbourne with his wife, Trudy, and his daughter, Grace, and twin boys, Hudson and Billy. Mark, great to have a fellow Aussie on the podcast, but welcome to season two. Yeah, g'day. Good to be here with you guys. Well, let's let's jump in. We have so much to discuss, and um, by means of just entering this conversation with you, it would be great to talk a little bit about embodied community and some of the conversation right now around digital versus in-person ministry. And in in a moment, I'll put a couple of, you know, it's a Barna podcast, so I'm going to put a couple of numbers in in front of you. Um, but I think it's it's safe to say that those that are navigating pastoral ministry at the moment uh, are also navigating the complexity of the digital revolution and how that affects our ministry approach, our ministry philosophies, and even physical space. Um, So a a few just data points from Barna about this idea of in-person and embodied community, um, because these are great talking points. Um, Take take worship. 65% would say they would lean towards an in-person experience as more meaningful versus 9%. For building community, 68%. Um, For learning from the sermon or a message, this is actually kind of surprising to me, 59% would find that more meaningful in an in-person environment versus 11% online. So um, when it comes to just that conversation, Mark, we're, we're, we're operating in a digital world, but there's this growing sense of hunger for real community and in-person connection. What what are some of your thoughts on that? Well, I think you're right. We sort of crashed into digital community, uh, digital community, and digital forms. You know, in a very fast time with the pandemic, and I think the reality that many people had to go online uh, to continue to do church, um, you know, was an accelerator. Um, so I think a, a couple of thoughts. Um, so firstly, I think 
I had a realization ah, maybe about eight months ago where I realized that you've got two forms of church. You've got the local church, and you've got the universal church. Um, most people's expression, most of their Christian lives, right, most of history is lived in the local church. That's a local body of people whose bodies are meeting in a particular time and place, who live in physical proximity and who just do discipleship together, following of Jesus together. And buildings are often in stone representations of our institutions, what we repeatedly do to form ourselves. Uh, and then there's another form of the church, which is exactly what we're doing now. It's the universal church. Um, we're in different continents speaking now, uh, attending different local churches. Uh, in the pandemic, I was on calls with people in multiple uh, uh, denominations on multiple countries, on multiple, uh, multiple uh, continents. And so I think that uh, it's a wonderful thing when we connect with the universal church. You can do certain things of, you know, uh, coming together and praying with people, but it's different to the local church. And I think what happened was in the last year, you know, few years when digital started to really take off and online video and streaming and Zoom and all these things, social media, is that it began to blur the differences between the local and universal church for us. All of a sudden, what happened was the institutional power, perhaps not institutional power, but the power of the universal church to send information across the world expand in a way that we've not seen before. Um, and I think this began to confuse people. So for me, what I realized was that uh, this wasn't a binary choice between digital and not digital. The bigger question for me was understanding the difference between local and universal and how these new technologies change that. So what I learned is I, I, I do a podcast from here in Australia and people are listening to it all over the world and we have people sending in emails and, and I can impact living still in Australia, the universal church, uh, but I began to realize as we came out of two years of lockdown in Melbourne is that discipleship happens in an embodied local church in a very different way. So I feel that difference between the local and the universal is is actually something which not a lot of people have picked up. So I feel like there was this pressure on particularly local pastors when it came to their buildings and how they thought about digital to actually almost try and act as if they were some kind of universal church. I'm hoping I'm making that point. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, it, it it totally makes sense, and it did seem that um, the the pandemic, as time wore on, did something to amplify our need for real community. And you know, when I looked at the life of Jesus, I just found so much around this idea of physical touch, where he would reach out and touch them and pray for them and and heal them. So many of his actions were embodied; they played out in a real place, a real time with real people. Um, do you feel like now, as you've kind of made this uh, distinction between the universal church and a local church, which is super helpful, how do you think that plays out in terms of our our spaces? How does that play out for you in the leader of your church there in Melbourne? How do you feel like that affects how we go about worship or weekend services or ministry in our built environments and facilities? I.e., have you made any changes, any shifts uh, in terms of your physical spaces? Mm. Yeah, so I, ha- I had this uh, really interesting moment a number of years ago, just before the pandemic, actually, I think in 2019, when I visited John Wesley's um, sort of collection of buildings that you know he, he created in East London. And you saw there was the congregation, but then there were these smaller rooms which facilitated different types of community. There was an outreach to the community as well. And so it was just really fascinating for me to see that. I came to Melbourne and, and during the pandemic, I didn't realize, but in downtown Melbourne, they'd refurbished the Wesley Chapel. And it's in Lonsdale Street in downtown Melbourne. And they didn't have all the buildings. You couldn't get around them all. But they've done this incredible redesign of them. And I went there just like only in, in January. And what struck me was the way that it actually mirrored Wesley's Chapel in East London. It was almost a replica. And really, the, the idea behind that was an ecosystem of discipleship that John Wesley created, and the buildings simply reflect that. So what I began to realize is what Wesley did is at a time when the Industrial Revolution, the early stages of globalization were changing the world, people had new freedoms. They were looking for new ways to connect. And Wesley didn't just put on a, a Sunday service. He created other buildings, smaller ones for his classes, his divisions, his bands, these places, to actually create a new way of interacting with people through repeated practices that were then set in stone and, and wood in the form of buildings. And that's been a real challenge to me. I think what I've realized is that 
people need the Sunday service, but they also need second spaces in buildings to do discipleship together. And Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that I would say is what's happening is that there's the digital revolution, but there's also the neoliberal economic revolution which also is changing our buildings, where Marc Auger says that increasingly throughout our world, we see consumerism creating non-places, the airport, the mall, where people are basically created with spaces and a lot of them are beautiful and there's a lot of money thrown at them where they're just simply consumers buying stuff. So I began to see that people need places where they're not just asked to buy something, they're actually asked to step into a form of community. So the buildings then actually do a form of education for people. Um, so we're starting to think about that. We have we rent a space, we've got our office space here, we rent a space, but we're starting to reimagine our office space, less is just where we do the office administration. And we just redid this hall we had at the back, which we weren't using. But we're starting to imagine, what if we reinvented that Wesleyan second space of discipleship for the 21st century, for people living through this digital world and this sort of neoliberal environment? Mm. You know, Mark, I I love that phrase you just used, an ecosystem of discipleship. Uh, It's been thematic even in season one for those who were sort of listening along with us that um, in different ways and using different language, that sort of idea kept bubbling to the surface that one of the ways that one of our guests said it was, you know, to blur the lines between the way people perceive the community or the city or the town and then where they believe the church building sort of begins, these second spaces, if you will. Um, and according to some of the research that Barna and Aspen Group did, it's really fascinating. Uh, they asked sort of two connected questions, but um, asked them very distinctly. The first question was, you know, who do you believe that a church belongs to? And both practicing Christians and non-Christians Christians, actually both, the, um, the, the highest answer, the most common answer was that the church belongs to the community it serves. Both non-Christians and practicing Christians said that, that it belongs to the community it serves. And then the question was asked to practicing Christ- Christians, when you imagine yourself sitting in the church— What is the sort of thing you are most likely to feel? And the majority answer was, well, a connection to God, which poses an interesting dichotomy for practicing Christians. On one hand, we believe the church belongs to the community. And on the other hand, we believe the church is a place where we connect to the divine. There is both this sort of horizontal and vertical um, movement happening. So, You know, I want to ask you, along the lines of what you just said about the ecosystem of discipleship that a church can and should create, especially in the modern world, um, how do you think maybe some of the challenges to creating that, maybe even in your own experience, but as you've sort of worked with and supported and served church leaders and churches all over the world— what are some of the unique challenges that we face, and wh- what are some ways in which that you see that happening, that churches are leaning into both the vertical and the horizontal uh, in ways that really um, embodies the kingdom uh, in, in a meaningful way? I think, I think the thing I'm, um, you know, I'm always trying to think ahead and see where I see trends going and perhaps see things which people aren't thinking about which will become issues. So I think that there's a number of things we could talk about. You know, like often in Melbourne, I'll, I'll duck into the Anglican or Catholic cathedrals and you, and you see people who are tourists coming in or just city workers and different people and having, having that transcendent experience in a place like a cathedral. So I think most of us are, are aware of that. I think also most of us are aware of, you know, different churches which you know, have a real interface with the community through, through you know, perhaps serving the poor or different community functions. I think though that there can be a slight dichotomy in that we understand when that we understand the concept of what I began talking about that you know we need to have those second spaces which disciple people and form them um, and then people also say we need for the church to outreach into the community the church building should be for everyone but I think where the mo- the place we're finding ourselves moving into is I think we're sort of moving out of that neoliberal environment where it's just like we have these public spaces which are just neutral or perhaps you buy some stuff there and there's a slight value of, of, you know, buy these goods or whatever. But we're now moving into a much more contested space. And and I think what you're seeing is that there is a return to a form of tribalism. There is a return to more uh, aggressive values pushed by government, corporations, different things. And so actually 
in a sense, we're trying to form people in our buildings. And when you create public-facing buildings, increasingly in forms of regulation, government, uh, uh, you know, how, what the public expect of that, you're going to see more battles in that space. And, uh, you know, we live in a world of increasing bureaucracy and bureaucracy can also be used as something to form people. So I think a number of churches are going to find perhaps their missions to the community increasingly restricted by strictures, which is trying to form them in the opposite direction as the church, particularly in a lot of Western environments, finds itself in a more fragile place. And I don't think a lot of people have thought about that, but I'm hearing that from people. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's how do you do public when increasingly the public space will be contested? Mm. I want to follow up on that because I think that's a fascinating thought and it can, maybe it can cause some alarm, you know, for some church leaders who are saying, oh, but what does that mean, Mark? Does that mean this sort of, um, you know, uh, <laughs> like um, local farmer's market that we're hosting here in our back parking lot is that that's going to be contested. And and some leaders are all actually already facing that here at home in our church. Um, we've spent almost, you know, 20 decades long before I got here sort of developing relationships with our city and our county. And it is interesting what you're saying is happening in these small little ways. Oh, it's, it's not enough just to say we're offering, uh, you know, goodwill towards our city, there are it is contested space. So, um, I know this is an area you've uh, spoken um, beautifully toward as well. Do you think that there is something to be said for then? Uh, maybe the elevation of the stuff that maybe can't be contested or can't as easily be contested, like, you know, beauty or art, or you were talking about, you know, the shopping mall as just these functional spaces, these sort of non-spaces, you just go to have a transactional, transactional experience and leave. Do churches maybe have an opportunity before us to think about our properties and our buildings and ask the question, instead of just asking, asking functional questions, even goodwill functional questions like a farmer's market or a food pantry, but instead to say, okay, can we actually create in the midst of a contested age and a contested culture, can we create spaces that are not as easy to contest, spaces of beauty, uh, spaces of sort of quiet and calm and peace? Do you think there are opportunities like that for the church ahead? Um. I'm not sure there is, <laughs> um, which is probably a different, a different answer. Um, I would have said yes five, six years ago. Um, but I think what we're seeing increasingly is even the terms of beauty has been contested. That mm. increasingly what you're seeing is the idea of beauty creates a hierarchical reality and that in a world where increasingly objectivity is sought for subjectivity, that even beauty is contested. And even we're seeing uh, issues around public sound even contested. And, and uh, so I actually think we're seeing a, a tremendous contesting at multiple levels. Now, I also just want to say, this is not every environment. We know people listen to this all over the place, but maybe in Melbourne, maybe in California, we're, we're seeing the front wave of this. And, um, you know, I actually think it, it's, I think partially... What, what the period that we've come out of was a 30-year period, I'm using the term neoliberal here, uh, which is more an economic term than perhaps it means in the US of liberal as in left wing. Um, but in that economic term, it was sort of like we could create these sort of nothing places which are just sort of pleasant and happy. I think that's disappearing now. Um, so I think what we're sort of finding, the church in the West will always find itself in a contested position. And interesting, it helps us understand a little bit um, the older church buildings, which in a sense were sort of public statements that sort of understood that they performed a role in the society and that there would be some sort of tension that comes there. So I'm not sure we sort of get to create this place where everyone's sort of happy without it being so bland and nothing mm. um, to be inoffensive. And, and even we see things which are attempting to be inoffensive um, find, itself, find themselves get in trouble these days. So I think we're in a multicultural, fractious uh, uh, you know, decentralized world. And I think it's going to be like that for the next few centuries. Oh, sorry, not centuries, probably decades. So thinking about that creativity is going to be a really interesting task before us as the church. Can, can you just define that term for us, Mark, neoliberal? Yeah, so I, I just would define neoliberal as the belief that increasingly the market um, should be, the market should run free in the world. And, and in a sense that, um, you know, the individual moves from being a citizen 
to a consumer. Um, now, I think we're actually seeing a backlash against that. Um, but, you know, a classic example is here in You're Australia. You're describing we have like Westfield. modern Western um, capitalism. Um, yes, and I wouldn't even say Western. I would say this yeah. is this is Bangkok. This is yeah. you know this is uh-huh. uh, all, many you know, there's many places across the world, but not just capitalism. Um, it's a hyper form of the market. You know, capitalism has been around for three centuries, uh, as we understand it. This is a, a, a mode where hyper individualistic. You are a consumer, and and let the market determine culture. Um, but we're seeing a pushback against that. But that has deeply shaped our public spaces. Mm. Um, you know, the, the 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 wing of the of LAX, um, where often you know I fly back from the US to Australia, looks identical to the West. It's built by Westfield Mall Company. It looks identical to my local mall. So I can sit mm. in the LAX wing and go. I, I feel like I could be in Australia here. So the differences are sort of pushed away, and the market reshapes the world. But I think that's we're moving out that, of that period. Yeah. But that's almost shaped our understanding of churches as well. Trying to create these like community churches, which are sort of beige, you know, where everyone just could be happy and and there's sort of events happening and stuff like that. That's a bad so explanation. You, you've, you've mentioned a phrase, and thank you for that. It's, it's a super helpful mm. explanation. Uh, the phrase second spaces. So just on a, mm. you know, real practical note, um, I mean, personally, I'm an advocate for four years because I feel like the the church stream I was raised in was very good at auditoriums, became very good at auditoriums and production. Um, But we didn't think too much of areas of human to human connection, i.e. foyers. So I'm passionate about foyers and coffee and how do you keep people? And Jay writes about lingering spaces. You've used the word Mm. second spaces. It's a great phrase. Um, Mm. To a pastor who's listening to this, what does that look like? So I think what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to grab with this idea of a second space is Wesley, in, in you know, and his model of awakenings has shaped so much of our understanding. And and there's really interesting, like when you read some of his diaries, you get this interesting nuance. We often focus on the big event where he gathered people. He'd go to Bristol and 22,000 miners would turn up and he'd preach the gospel to them. But then you read this thing that he started what what he started this ecosystem of discipleship. So I'll say stuff like, yeah, I went to Newcastle and 10,000 people came out to hear me and 80 people ended up in the society. The society was the invitational second space, which was open to anyone who wanted to follow Jesus deeply. You know, and, and Wesley was radical in, in different classes, men and women, uh, different races coming together to be discipled. Uh, but it was exclusive in the sense that it was only those who really wanted to go deeper with Jesus. And I think what we're trying to do at the moment as the sort of digital neoliberal world means people come less and less, like regular tendencies, like temperature every four weeks now. Mm. We need to reverse that. And I think we, we've made out uh, the, the neoliberal sort of world is all about events, big events, the big concert, the big sporting game. So we've almost tried to make our, our worship like that, come to the event but discipleship and, and if, if you like, the magic happens <laughs> uh, where the big event often is information and experience, but transformation and formation and, and discipleship happens in that second space. Uh, so that's when people go deeper with each other. It's a repeated pattern and there's a pain level there. And what I mean by that is there's a bit where you're like, oh, my goodness, my flesh is being challenged here and I'm, that's happening in community and I think it's that space which is actually disappearing in the church and we're not noticing that it's disappearing. Um, and, and, yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, wow. No, I, there's so much there that, that we could unpack. Um, I know in your writings uh, you, have a lot of, you have a lot of hope for the future of the church and there is this tension right now between we're hyper-connected and yet we're isolated and lonely. I mean, for example, Gen Z, spends an average of 7.3 hours a day on their smartphones. You know, my 14-year-old son, we, he finally got a smartphone like a month ago. And uh, <laughs> I feel like I've crossed a threshold. There's no going back. <laughs> 79% of the same generation say they're lonely. In other words, we're connected, but we're not really connected. You have hope for the church. What opportunities, Mark, are you seeing for renewal that that you would put in front of pastors and, and leaders? Mm. As someone who talks about culture um, and, and, and you know, has often been a bit of a you know, foreshadowing of some of these more concerning trends, 
and, and have doing that over a while now. I find people outside the church are unbelievably interested in talking about these things. They see these things. You, you talk to a parent at the park, you talk to a, you know, someone from Gen Z on a train, you know, they, they are deeply aware of these issues and they want to talk about them. You know, if, if you look across, you know, the developed world at the moment, there are very few people who are like, everything's going great. Yay. Let's get going forward. Mm. There is deep concern in the culture and people are looking for other ways. And, you know, George Hunter, the sort of missiologist talked about, um, you know, often the church has these moment evangelistic opportunities where there's a gap between idols. And I think we are moving out of that sort of neoliberal hyper digital world into something else. We don't know what it is yet. But I see that there's going to be opportunities. You know, I think I read, you know, I think it was like in, in you know, the cities like Frankfurt, you know, in Europe, it's like 40% of people are living alone. You know, that is the future. You know, South Korea is struggling with a whole issue and is looking at how it does its welfare because increasingly the future citizen is one person living alone with very little connection. And so I think that the community is important, but I think there's, it's got to be Christ centered community. Because I think everyone's trying to do community for community's sake and it falls over because people have been formed as individuals through radical individualism. So they want community, but to have community, they have to be formed in the way of Jesus. Otherwise, we're just going to get mass movements, which look very frighteningly like the ones we had in the 1930s. Mm. Yeah, it's a good word. It's a it's a really poignant, sobering word, but I think such an important one for us as uh, followers of Jesus and as church leaders um, to hear, Mark. Yeah, just like Benjamin said, I mean, we could we could sit and and talk to you for hours, mostly because it takes me extra time to just process the things you're saying and question myself: Am I understanding Mark Sayers correctly? <laughs> Which is my experience <laughs> with you. Um, but as we sort of close uh, down at least this conversation, uh, I just want to invite you. You know, most people know you and know your work and think of you really as um, a prophetic voice, a wise sage that's, um, you know, truly prophetic, uncovering what's beneath the surface of what we see happening in culture today. But what I also know about you is that you're a pastor and you love people and your deep concern is that people are formed into Christ-likeness in the midst of whatever cultural moment we're going through. So talk to the pastors, and there are many, uh, the pastors and church leaders who are listening, in the midst of all of these challenges that we face, uh, in the midst of um, the contested spaces that we are navigating um, yeah, as we close, maybe speak to the pastor, the church leader, uh, with some hope. Um, I love how, how open you are about saying, we don't know, we don't know what is to come, but there are some things that we do know. So just speak some hope, uh, to those who are listening. Mm. Well, I, I think that we're moving into a moment where a lot of the established voices don't have answers. <laughs> that can be a little bit scary when you're like, show me the book, show me the website, show me the person who can answer all these challenges. But often what happens in moments like this of transition is that you get bottom-up answers. You get a sort of crowdsourced answer. And so my hope is that a bunch of people are going to experiment everywhere from, you know, Cape Town to Reykjavik, pastors, um, you know, maybe with 20 people in their church. And, and together through the Holy Spirit working through us in that people exploring this in their local context, that these really exciting answers are going to emerge. Um, you know, I'd, I'd really like to give hope to, to people out there who perhaps are thinking, oh, look, I don't have $50 million to build a building. Often we can have that sense. You know, as I said, we, we've got our offices here. You know, we're, we're, we're a church here in Melbourne. We, you know, we don't always have heaps of money. And, and we just redid. We've got a basketball court and we've been imagining this second space thing. And, you know, like, oh, man, you know, it had so many problems. It was built in the 1960s. Someone just connected it onto our offices. And we just began to pray, like, what, what could God do here? And literally, we just, some of the guys just repainted it. They made it look really nice. We just put carpet in yesterday. And there's a bunch of us who went in and we were standing in it yesterday. And, like, this is not done for millions of dollars. This is like us coming out of a pandemic, giving down, all this sort of stuff, leading a church mostly of millennials, and, you know, we just stood there in this carpeted space, redone. You know, there were guys like painting past midnight. And you saw the community come together and it was an empty room. But I think what that symbolized to me was this redone, refurbished, empty room. It wasn't the refurbishment which excited me. It's the potential of what's going to happen in that space. Mm 
And, you know, in a sense, you know, there's a classic Churchill quote, you know, we shape our abilities and they shape us. But I actually think what's also happening at the moment is that the actual Holy Spirit is shaping us in the midst of what seems like a crisis to think opportunist, opportunistic, I can't even say that word, opportunistically, that's it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I would just encourage people that you may feel like, hey, I'm just here doing my thing. You know, I'm not in the center of things, but we live in a decentralized world. The Holy Spirit is out there seeding dreams. Um, so what you may come up with might, out of a conversation with someone else and conversation over here, be actually part of the next thing that God is doing. So the crisis is here, yeah, in a way, but that frees you to be incredibly creative and to think differently and think out of the box. And when that happens, incredible things happen amongst the people of God. Yeah. That's a great word. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you for all of your work and uh, for for really serving the church so faithfully. Thank you for uh, for joining us for this conversation today. Oh, my pleasure. It's been really fun to chat about these things. Benjamin, man, you know, every time I read Mark's work, um, I've read, you know, his last three books have been so profoundly helpful and challenging to me every time I hear him on his podcast or other podcasts. I'm, I'm, I'm always sort of, there's almost like a reset that happens, you know, and uh, that was certainly the case today. So many key sort of takeaways, things to ponder and chew on. I'm curious, Benjamin, what, what sort of stood out to you? Yeah, well, ditto. Um, you know, I think there's so much there uh, that Mark brings, and I'd encourage listeners. You know, chase down his books, listen to his podcast. Yeah. Um, there's, I think, a perspective there on just our modern world that that he brings that's been very helpful to me uh, personally. One of the practical things for me that jumped out of that conversation is that phrase "second spaces." And I loved his description of, you know, um, the history of Wesley and, and smaller environments. So to, what I like about the phrasing second space is you're not saying the first space gets replaced or is redundant, but you're adding to that with an environment that maybe is more curated towards smaller discipleship and spiritual formation so there's a recognition that, hey, maybe this doesn't happen in our large auditoriums or our large venues. So if I was listening to that, I mean, for me, there's a great conversation to have around church staff, uh, teams, leaders. Hey, what would a second space look like in our environment or in our context that really facilitates something that our first space doesn't do? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that connects really well with one of the things he said toward the end that really stood out to me. It's something I've heard him talk about extensively before in other ways, but you know, the sort of massive, almost global, universal decentralization of everything that is happening. And then the beautiful hope that we have that uh, some of the most wonderful, creative, unexpected, surprising, beautiful answers are very well going to bubble up from the bottom, you know, and the bottom not in terms of like a hierarchy, but just from the masses, you know, the foundation of just the mass of people trying things. And I think those second spaces are the spaces in which so much of that happens. It's not this big sort of, you know, event-driven, personality-driven space or a transactional space, but it really is a much more communal, intimate, and therefore in many ways creative space. So I agree with you, Benjamin. I, that was a, a great word and a challenge and a reminder for me, just as a church leader, and I've got I've to put more intentionality in creating those types of spaces and then inviting our people uh, to inhabit those spaces together with one another because it's in those spaces. You know, he was talking about John Wesley and uh, the second space. It wasn't the big event, but it was like a few, you know, open to all, but a few came and they were really deeply sort of entrenched and saying, okay, I'm committed to this thing. And, and even, you know, his, his point that there's some pain there. And, uh, you know, transformation doesn't come without pain. We want to transform our bodies. You got to go to the gym and work out and run and all those sorts of things. So, so much good stuff there. And uh, I'm sure those of you listening have a ton to chew on and think about and, and, and pray about as well. Just want to remind you again, um, if you want to dive deeper into some of the conversations we're having, please check out the journals. And uh, yeah, as a newer podcast, if this conversation or all of our conversations or any of the 
conversations are helpful to you, it is extremely helpful to us if you would go and um, share the podcast around with folks you think it'd be helpful to and um, like it and review it and subscribe wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Thanks again so much for joining us, for listening. And we're really excited about all the conversations to come in season two. And uh, we will talk to you all very soon.